Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. And uh, I hope uh, Professor Ian Charles has a speedy recovery and uh, I'm filling in for him in a way. But it's a great pleasure, of course, for me to talk to you today about the research we've been conducting. Of course, I just arrived here, so we really haven't been doing any research yet here. But soon we will be starting our research and I'd love some of you to be part of it and maybe come back and talk more about this. Now, my research is really in dementia. I'm bridging, I think, the clinical and the very uh, molecular side. So my research is very biomedical, not very care related, which is done actually by my wife, who has the chair of dementia care here at UEA. So we're doing, we're doing complementary research where one does biomedical, the other one does more care related research. So it would be very biomedical today, but I try to digest it as best as I can Feel free, though, to ask any questions. Also, if you have problems understanding my silly German accent, feel free to ask. I'm not offended anymore. <laughs> so, first of all, I have to, to explain my slightly pretentious uh, talk title, which is actually Latin. There you go. A two brain, healthy aging and dementia. Well, so where does this A2 brain come from? And, of course, it comes from... Julius Caesar's assassination, where he says, the last words he says, a two brute, so Brutus, even you Brutus, betrays me and kills me. So why did I chose this kind of, it's a very strange kind of citation to use for this. And it's really that uh, I think the most common age-related diseases are heart disease, stroke and dementia. Now the older you get, the higher dementia goes in the ranking where basically once you hit 80 as a uh, age, dementia is the most common disease you have with age. So in a way, you've managed to overcome heart disease and stroke, you had a healthy lifestyle, you didn't smoke, you didn't eat too much sugar, and then dementia comes along. And pretty much at the moment, we're still a bit helpless to know what, how to actually prevent it. So I'm going to talk about this later. So in a way, the dementia is the final betrayal of your brain dragging you down and you think, oh, but I've done so well, actually. I've lived such a healthy lifestyle. Now, the irony, of course, is that actually Caesar never said these words. Instead, they were invented by this man, William Shakespeare, who basically added it to his uh, Julius Caesar play because for dramatic effect, which you can say is fantastic, but it's an irony that Caesar actually never said these words. Now, I talk about aging and dementia, and really the UK has, worldwide we have an aging population, but the UK in particular has an aging population. These are just data from the government um, where they basically pre predict uh, the amount of uh, different age groups which will increase with time in orange by 2033. And what you can see that in particular the older ages will really increase a lot. And I will contribute to that in a way. But which in a way, so any, the royal in charge at that time will have to write a lot of telegrams to centenarians because there will be many, many more people living much longer lives. Now, this is, same applies really for the region, really, and the local population. And this is, again, a prediction for 2035 for the East Anglia. And what you can see, East Anglia, Norfolk and Suffolk in particular are really some of the most aging, population, <coughs> aging populations along with the south coast of England um, which really will see the highest proportion of aging people. So there will be a large number of aging uh, people around in, in the local area. Now this of course makes a big impact on dementia and dementia is really, this is a study, um, um, a consultancy done by the Office of Health, Economics and Alzheimer's Research UK, where they predict the amount of people with dementia over the next like 40 years. It was done in 2011, as you can see. And the basically predictions are that the number of dementia cases will double or triple over these, this time. So in a way, there is a ticking time bomb and the government has really woken up to this because they realise the services, NHS services, are really creaking at the seams already for aging population. We really need to do something about this. We really need to address this dementia issue. And again, the same on a local level. This is done by the Norfolk County Council. I'm very happy that Joyce Hopwood is actually here representing it. Um, here you can see in the in colored the estimated prevalence of dementia cases in the in the Norfolk region. 
um, which you can see the darker the color, the more dementia cases. So there are, is a large, number of, uh, a large number of dementia cases around. Now, dementia. Dementia is really this kind of, the term is a blessing and a curse for us researchers. It's pretty much like cancer, that there are so many different diseases under this umbrella, which really is good for marketing. Everybody knows if you talk about dementia, but what do you really mean by dementia? And I always say this is, it's a really, it's an umbrella term, dementia, and it really means literally a collection of symptoms. This is how it is defined clinically. And the most common subtypes of dementia you have here, and I've ranked them in the order of how common they are. The most common one, Alzheimer's <coughs> disease. And of course, this is what people usually associate with dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common. If people talk about dementia, they usually talk about Alzheimer's disease. But Alzheimer's disease is only one of the diseases of dementia. Others, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies, which are all put under this umbrella. Now, this looks all very straightforward and easy, but unfortunately, the real life picture is much more messy. So this is how it actually looks on a scientific level. So here you have all the dementia, oops, can you see this? All the dementia subtypes, and then you have all these different proteins and pathologies and genes. And as you can see, they're all overlapping even with each other, which makes it very, very difficult. And even if you go further into specific diseases like the TDP43, proteins, there are four subtypes again which have completely different clinical sy uh, syndromes. So dementia is very, very complex in the background and this creates enormous challenges for us as researchers to delineate them, to help patients, but it becomes really critical now when we're really at the stage of finding treatments and trying to help prevent things. Because if you want to treat something, of course, you don't want to just treat a very general syndrome. You want to actually treat a very specific disease and a very specific protein. Just saying, genes are here mentioned. However, the genetic contribution to dementia is very, very small. Only less than 10% really of dementia patients have a genetic mutation. So this is important to remember that Genetics is very often not the answer. I'm not going to talk about our genetic work today, only about the, what we call sporadic, so patients where, which do not have a genetic background. Now, I'll leave this now, so it scared you enough with this scary picture, which is very, very busy, and go back to how do we actually do now in the clinic? How do we do a diagnosis? How do we actually define these dimensions? And really classically this has been done and is still done because we can't measure actually these proteins in people. So there's no blood test we can do to detect these proteins. Only very few of these proteins we can detect. Instead, what we're going to, we're looking at certain symptoms the patients present with. And one of the most common one, of course, virtually everybody knows is memory. But there are three other ones which are really also common as well in dementia. Behavior changes, which can mean more impulsivity or a lack of initiation, what we call apathy, but can really go to very severe behavioral changes and to aggression as well. Language, very, lots of the dementia patients can present what we call aphasia, so problems in speaking and understanding speech, and motor, which means really motoric problems, so walking or grasping or um, falling. And these are usually associated with certain brain areas. And I'm afraid you have to get used to these brain pictures because I'm a big neuroimaging fan. So you can see that what we can say that memory is really associated with a particular region in the brain, which is called the hippocampus, and which I talk about. Behavior is more associated with these, what we call frontal brain regions. So here are the eyes of the patient, actually. This is the front and this is the back of the brain. Motor with the motor cortex and language, which is like broker areas in, in very general terms. Now, how do we map these? And I will first really focus now, I'm not going to talk about our work in language and motor. Instead, I will talk more about memory and behavior, which I think is more, in, um, uh, yes, just to focus on that. In particular, memory, which is of course very important for Alzheimer's disease. And this is, the, as I said, the most common form of dementia and Alzheimer's disease uh, has, as you, lots of you will know, uh, patients present with severe memory problems very early on. Now, just to give you a bit of, of background, because people sometimes don't know where does this actually come from, Alzheimer's disease. Well, it comes from this 
grumpy looking German psychiatrist called Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who was the first really describing this disease. Now the beauty of it is that you're not only having a picture of him, but you have also a picture of his first patient, which is very rare in the medical society that you still get the picture of actually the person he first described. And this was the patient, the first Alzheimer's disease patient called uh, Mrs. August Dieter, who presented in the clinic, who actually at that time was in the mental asylum. This is where they kept at that time, at the end of the 19th century, beginning 20th century, they kept really dementia patients. And you can even see, you can get the original notes actually Alzheimer made when he talked to her, which I translated to your benefit from German for you. You can challenge yourself with this. It's very old German though. It's very tricky to understand, even for me. So he asked, where do you live? Oh, you have been to our place. Are you married? Oh, I'm so confused. Where are you right now? Here and everywhere, here and now. You must not think badly of me. So a very confused person, very disorientated, doesn't know where, where she is really, who she's talking to. And many clinicians before Alzheimer described this disease clinically, but Alzheimer made the critical uh, step then. After her death, he basically got her brain and investigated the brain and found very specific changes in the brain of Mrs. Dieter. And these are actually original drawings. You can still find them as well. So these are the, the, the changed cells he found in the brain of uh, Mrs. Dieter. And this is pretty much what we still see today if you look under the microscope. So these cells, oops, can you see this? So these cells here, these are tau tangles, which you have also up here, basically, which are one sign with amyloid plaque for Alzheimer's disease. Now these days, there's, you know, it's much more complicated in a way how people think Alzheimer's disease generates and they have this, that amyloid and tau interact and cause then this kind of synaptic and neuronal loss. And then basically you have other factors. You have this, they call this genetic environmental risk factors. It's really just a fudge term because nobody knows what these factors are really are. But of course, at the site, you have other things in particular, vascular lesions and neuroinflammation, which I'll come back to the inflammation part later. And there is what's very typical for all of the dementias that they're spreading and progressing in a very specific pattern. And for Alzheimer's disease, it is this pattern, which is called the Bragg staging, where it starts in the brain in the region called the hippocampus, or more specifically the entorhinal cortex, and then spreads across the cortex to the later stages of the disease. So this is from the beginning to the end stages of the disease, where later the whole brain is affected by this disease. Now, I mentioned the hippocampus already a few times, and this is really, if you look at a very simple uh, scan of a, of a this is actually, well, this is actually my brain, so there you go. You, ca you can check my brain now if it looks any good or not. But uh, what you can see, I always wonder, actually, I always, every time I have a scan, I'll check quickly myself if there's nothing dodgy <laughs> happening there. What I marked here in red is this hippocampus region uh, which is really important, as I mentioned here, for memory. And I always give this example, which is a great example. So, for example, uh, your wedding day is a perfect example of a memory you have stored in your hippocampus. And with your med wedding day, you have very specific information stored with it. You will have stored the, the date and the time, hopefully. You will know who were the other guests, where was it, maybe church, maybe a registry office, and uh, for example, you might even remember the presents. I don't remember any of the presents we got, but my wife definitely does who we got the presents from. So you have very specific information, what we call spatio-temporal information. So the space and the time where things happen, who was there, with whom, at what time. The tricky thing, of course, of memory is that loads of things overlap with this. So you might have been to the same church for a baptism. You might have been to other people's weddings at the same church, or you might have been at other parties with the same guests, which really creates the confusion. And the hippocampus is extremely good at filtering out your specific memories that you're not getting confused between all your memories you're storing up over your lifetime, which you can imagine for an older person that is a lot, a lot of memories you have actually over that time. Now these are now two scans. And this is the dreaded audience participation part. 
So after I've told you now that the hippocampus, which you can uh, see here, is pretty shrunk in Alzheimer's disease, is the person on the left or on the right an Alzheimer's disease patient? There. <laughs> left it is right, yes. So this is where you can see, this is the same age people have, uh, and this is a hippocampus which looks very healthy, and this is where you can see that it is shrunk nearly, it is shriveled. And this is what happened really that this kind of disease process started and this nerve cells start to die and it actually shrinks together. Now you can see now why memory is a gold standard for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Because if this region is one of the first affected, of course we want to test memory and we want to detect it then. But there is a problem with that. And the problem is, and I've borrowed this slide from, unfortunately it's very busy, from the Cambridge Centre for Aging and Neuroscience where they did a study uh, scanning people from 18 to 90 years of age and measured the hippocampus. And what you can see with this line is that the older you get, your hippocampus is shrinking regardless if you have dementia or not, the older you get, your hippocampus is shrinking, which makes, creates a problem, because how do you distinguish then somebody who is healthy and just elderly from somebody who has actually dementia? And it creates a real problem in the clinic because you might think, oh, maybe this person just had a bad day, so their memory is not so good, the scan doesn't look too bad. Mm. So very often people get there for have to wait maybe for even up to a year until they get a confirmed diagnosis which for the families is a dreadful time because they have to wait a long long time to see what happens. Now the other problem is that hippocampus atrophy or the shrinkage and memory was always seen as very specific to Alzheimer's disease but we've done numerous studies over the years, which I'm not going to go into detail, but all it tells you is that other dementias can show similar memory problems. Now for a diagnosis that's not a problem necessarily, because if you have a dementia diagnosis that's okay, maybe it doesn't matter which type you have, but it becomes a real problem if you talk about treatment, because of, as I've told you before, different dementias have very different origins, very different proteins affected, so if you want to treat it, you really, you have to really th are in trouble that you're looking at the same region. So we looked at this macroscopically, microscopically in loads of patients, and what we find is they're very, very similar. Now, publishing this was an absolute pain because everybody hated this, of course. We just took away the nice distinction between Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And as somebody who think, well, it's not good enough just to say, well, you can't use this anymore, you have to propose something else. And the, other th the new thing we're really proposing is to move away from memory and looking more at disorientation or getting lost, which we think is a much more specific symptom of Alzheimer's disease and people really getting lost. And you will have this, that patients, it's very rare for a healthy elderly person to get lost or getting muddled where they are, especially in a new surrounding. While for dementia patients, they are really, really bad at this. They're getting really lost very easily. And of course, the police gets directly involved because the, patient, the, the person, they just walked to the corner shop and they've turned the wrong way and they're getting lost. So we thought how to measure this is though quite tricky because you can ask the patient, can ask the family, do you get lost? They might say yes, they might say no, but you want to kind of quantify it. You want to measure it in a way. So we got, uh, we thought, well, is there, in an environment which is very confusing. And I have to say, I was very influential in this decision because I get always lost in supermarkets. Supermarkets are awful for me because they're always, especially the very big supermarkets, you really get lost between shelves. And in particular, if they reshuffle the shelves and you think, last week, the cornflakes were here. I remember it. <laughs> But and you think really you're, getting, you're going crazy because they changed then the whole configuration of the supermarket. So what we did, we created a virtual reality, a PhD student of mine, created a virtual reality supermarket where patients, all they do, they see on, the, for example, an iPad or a computer screen, they see a very brief video, it's 30 seconds, where they start 
at the, always at the beginning of the supermarket and then they do three turns, three 90 degree turns until they are in front of a shelf. They just watch this video and then we ask them, now can you point to me where you started from in real life? Which you might think, well, that's very simple. I just did three turns. It must be over there. It must be over there. We had very complex grid outlaid in terms of gradings. We wouldn't need to bother because what we found is that uh, Alzheimer's disease patients were absolutely uh, poorly on this, while other dementias were similar to controls. So now we have a very specific measure then of disorientation, which really looks at this much more specifically, getting lost, how we can measure this. And it's a very simple test, which you can do in the clinic even, it takes just six, seven minutes. And we did some imaging as well and found some very nice region related to this, which I could go into detail what it means in terms of navigation, but I'm not... We did the same then again on a, on a mac microscopic level in terms of cell counting and it really got a very successful so that in the end now this measure, actually this what we call supermarket test, not very inspirational I guess the <laughs> name for test, has been adopted by the PREVENT study which is a UK wide uh, study to prevent Alzheimer's disease and the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia Consortium which use now this measure for their patients. So it's fantastic because it's really the next step to use it in drug trials, in multicenter drug trials. Now the next, we take it now to the next level because, I'll just go back to this. Um, one thing which we found always problematic is that actually there is not so much information out there how normal people navigate which is a big bit of a problem. And there is all these myth, urban myth around that women navigate differently than men. And every couple has shared a car journey, complains about this, but nobody really knows. There is a lot of, as I said, myth around this and there's no specific information. So we uh, joined forces with Deutsche Telekom of all the companies there are. Alzheimer's Research UK, and this is a collaboration between, um, between us and colleagues at UCL. Now, we are the patient side, the UCL people are the navigation specialists, basically, in healthy people. They know everything about navigation, which I know about what I know about in patients. And what we created, and unfortunately I can't show it to you because of non-disclosure agreements and so on and so forth, very complicated. We created a mobile game which is very entertaining, very fun to play for people, which will be distributed across Western Europe in initially and then worldwide for people to play and the data from this game will be sent to the servers and we can analyze it. With that we will hopefully get data, what we're estimating, around 750,000 people navigation data from which we can create like a population level navigation basis. And the nice thing is, i just show you the, 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 the process we went through, we basically created it within this game, so if you play it, you know you know the background for all of this, we created basically that people start and there's a whole story about people need to find something or navigating through spaces and we created an environment which makes it difficult in some parts to navigate and not others, which was really designed on a computer to be difficult in certain aspects. And you can see this is just a mock-up of the, how the game then in the end looks really, where we can change landmarks and everything. And from that, we basically can do then very fancy uh, computational modeling that we can see where do people get lost and can we actually predict where people get lost. Now this is a great tool then because then we can take this in the next step to the patients and can actually help the patients with this game hopefully and use a much more sophisticated model to really look into navigation and how people get lost. Unfortunately, as I said, I can't show you the game, which I'd love to because it's really nice. It will launch on the 4th of May. Uh, hopefully you will see it. Deutsche Telekom has really gone crazy in the PR campaign, so you will see about it, hopefully. So I've talked about memory and uh, really actually navigation in the end because this is really the region I've been mostly talking about. Now I want to switch a bit to behavior. And behavior is even trickier because behavior, to measure and quantify behavior, you first need to know, well, what's normal? And as you all know, we all have our tics, we all have our kind of weird behaviors and we consider ourselves still pretty normal, I guess. 
So what do we consider as normal is really tricky and to measure this in the patients can be very difficult, particularly if they have behavioral problems. We've done over the years many studies, I just highlight these briefly, where we look for example in insight, if patients actually have insight into their own disease and what we find is there are huge variation across different dementias where some dementias have really, patients don't think they have a disease while other dementias they are very very aware that there is a problem and they have a disease. The same for disinhibition, where we are looking then, as you can see with neuroimaging again, which brain regions are related to impulsivity being disinhibited. Now importantly, we're not doing only this very fancy imaging and measures. We're also taking then what does the carer and the family, what do they say? And does this really corroborate what we see in the scans in our tests? So it's always very important that we do this translation back to the family, which is really critical. But the way forward and where we're having actually at the moment where we think is really a lot of interesting thing is social cognition. And social cognition is really the kind of identifying, for example, emotion and other intentions in other people. Uh, this is, these are emotional faces and I've done always audience participation with this, but I've given up actually because always a few people get it wrong and I get worried. Eh? So you can see there are different kind of emotions displayed and the patient is just asked, well, which emotions are shown? It's a very, very simple test. And we have other tests which, for example, look at faux pas detection. Can you detect a faux pas? So this one is just a little cartoon with a story. And so the story is Jill has just moved into a new apartment. Jill went shopping and bought some new curtains for her bedroom. When she had just finished decorating the apartment, her best friend Lisa came over. Jill gave her a tour of the apartment and asked, how do you like my bedroom? Those curtains are horrible, Lisa said. I hope you're getting some new ones. <laughs> and then the patient is asked, well, did somebody say something they shouldn't have said? And there are other stories which are just nothing happens, really. It's a very standard story, so you have a control for this. Now, here you get the reverse now. OC means so elderly, healthy people. Alzheimer's disease patients, perfectly fine. They don't have a problem with this. But these other uh, dementia, uh, frontotemporal dementia, they're very, very impaired. And the families, that's what the family is always reporting. These patients, you know, they, very often it's reported a loss of empathy. They're not really getting the emotions the, the family is portraying anymore. And the family gets really upset. So we had examples, for example, where one daughter uh, was mugged and then the patient was very cold about it, didn't react at all. So it was very upsetting for the family, for the daughter. With this, we can, first time, we can really try to quantify this. Because again, if we want to treat it and change it, we need to quantify it. And this is really my postdoc, Maxime, who's really done this a lot, and he's joining us as a lecturer in September, so I'm very happy about that. Here's another example, quickly, uh, because again, this has been very successful, this has been adopted into a worldwide multicenter study as well for genetic frontotemporal dementia patients. So again, getting these tests out there, getting them involved as kind of outcome measures or diagnostic measures is really important for us. Now another study which really was done by Claire, who sits here today, who is a former PhD student of mine, has moved now to much better things, obviously, left me. And she's looked first time at gullibility. Gullibility was another thing we saw very often in our particular frontotemporal dementia patients, where patients would get cold called on the telephone and would give away money, credit card details, and so on. We even had uh, one patient, so th this really these patients, they reply to the, the princess of Zambia wants to, needs your help type emails, which everybody gets. We had even one patient who married a woman abroad without his wife or the family knowing and sending money to her. So gullibility is a big problem in certain types of dementias. Now Claire took a very clever approach and we really took the, an ultimatum game which is really coming from economics. It's a very kind of clever way of looking at behavior and how people use information and make decisions. And in this we had a basically a very simple task where uh, you can see this was still done in Australia, so you can see it's all in Australian dollars. Anita has made you an offer. You get you, Anita gets seven dollars. You get three dollars. Do you accept or reject? If you accept it, you get three dollars. If you reject it, you both get nothing. So very simple. With this, we could determine if people could understand what's fair and unfair because we were varying: 50-50, 70-30, 30-70, and of course, the more equal the distribution of the money, the more 
people are happy to accept it actually because it's an equal, it's a fair kind of share of the money. And the patients could do this, which surprised us actually very big, that they could distinguish between fair and unfair offers. But we had a second condition where we now just said Peter just won the lottery or Peter has lost his job. Where we think, well, this information, does this really trigger more discalability? That whether we, I guess, would be in general more happy to give somebody who has lost a job, maybe I'm more happy to give them more money than if they won the lottery, I'm not giving them any money because you know they have all this money. And this is uh, basically what we find that the FTD patients, they were really, had really many more problems with this actually in terms of while well, the controls were really adapting their changes to this. So the patients could not adapt to this change of the, of the kind of social context of this. And again, we've done imaging with this and found a kind of network of regions which are involved in this, uh, again, more frontal brain regions, and which just has come out now. now. As you can see, so behavior is still something, there is a lot, a lot of work to do, and there's very little, none really, very few, except for this test with the emotions and for pa, none of these tests have really made it into the clinic because they're still very complex and clinicians um, are reluctant to adapt them, ad adopt them for the clinic. So we're trying to get more and more tests which are easy to do and really can detect these symptoms. Now I've mentioned here network of regions and really this is the giveaway for the next part which will be a bit more technical but I hope I've digested it properly. So far I've really oversimplified the whole thing about certain regions and certain symptoms. The brain is a much more complex structure of course and our understanding of the brain is still, we're still struggling even on a healthy brain. Now this is just a normal brain and what you can see here, what I've done, these are the white matter connections, so these are all the connections in the brain and as you can see there are thousands, millions which are all very different. It's a really beautiful picture but tells you about the complexity. And you can try to look at the brain, therefore, as kind of these nodes in blue and the connections in between them, which are all processing information all together in a big network between themselves, which makes it much more complex to associate certain symptoms to certain regions. To understand this concept a bit better, I thought, well, how can we best you know, explain this? And if you think about this is a map of flight path frequency worldwide. So you have North America, South America, Europe, and what you can see, these are flight paths from, and you can see in particular Europe and North America and Asia have the highest frequency of flight path. And if you think the brain is maybe like this, the airports are these little hubs, and then we have all these connections to different regions, which really connect everything together. Now, if a flight from Norwich doesn't go, well, maybe some academics from UEA or some oil workers are upset, but the UK economy won't suffer. However, if Heathrow would shut down, you can see this would have a major impact on the UK. The same we think is happening in the brain, that there are certain key nodes, if they break down, actually can create a cascade of lots of things happening elsewhere in the brain. So we're coming away from a very localist view to a network view of the brain and see this dementia actually maybe is more a network disease, which also would explain why it spreads, that the network gets ex affected and affects one region, the next region, and so on and so forth. So the network approach is really interesting. And with this, you get these very beautiful maps then. So this is how do all brain regions connect with each other? You get this beautiful kind of measures where you have different regions connecting with each other, interacting with each other. And then of course you can look at this, how does this change with disease? And this is then very nice how specific brain regions are really connected to each other and how does it change with disease? And we've done work with this, uh, I've, we've done a few studies now with this, I'm just talking about one, which is about a region in the brain which has been really overlooked, it's called the cerebellum, it's called basically the little brain very kind of uh, condescendingly. Um, it's a brain region very far beh behind. So here the eyes, here's the back, this is the main brain and this is this region. What we always found in loads of studies that this region was affected in these patients and this was associated with certain symptoms in the patients. 
but we never understood it because it's a strange region. It really, what does it really contribute? It's a bit out of the way of where the symptoms are supposed to happen. So what we did, we did really look at the connectivity of that region to the other regions to see how they break down. And this is what we found is that they're very disease dementia specific, dementia subtype specific breakdowns for this connectivity between these brain regions. And that explains to you now, well, why is there a change in this region? Because it's connected to other regions which are affected by the disease. Now you still have a chicken and egg question here because which one is first affected? And this is what we need to find out now, obviously. But it's really that the connectivity of brain regions is really becoming a big, big thing. Now you might say, okay, well, this is all very fancy pantsy imaging and so on. Who on earth is going to use this information anywhere in the clinic? because you can't do this very fancy analysis. Now we're also really working on this, on identifying these changes in very simple clinical scans. So this is a study we've done where you can just visually rate scans in, which takes a clinician usually 30 seconds in the clinic. So again, translation of this information back into the clinic is very, very important to help uh, improving the diagnosis for the patients. Right, so now, I'll make it a bit more complicated even than that. Now I've talked about loads of brain regions, loads of symptoms, and now I'm telling you the whole thing is even a network. You think, well, how on earth is the clinician ever going to integrate all this information? Now this region is affected, this region is affected, this symptom, that symptom, it becomes so, so complex. Well, what we think, technology is the answer. And very complex technology which actually simplifies things, it's an irony which we really go down the artificial intelligence route, where we think there is an enormous potential for this, which really can help patients actually, and can really can help the clinicians. And it's a very simple concept. If you have a group of people, like these people here in different colors, what you want to know is, as a clinician, well, who is healthy and who has which type of dementia? And this is really what you want to know. And with that, you use your clinical knowledge, your clinical expertise, all this information you have from the family and so on. Well, we think that if you use these mathematical logarithms, you can actually use much more information in the background. So if we, we basically decided that we're using, we're sticking all the information we have in these algorithms. Very complex algorithm, but what it does actually, it can then, it, just based on the data, it can distinguish people and just tell you what it thinks which person has. And for example, does somebody has Alzheimer's disease or is healthy? And we can predict this with this algorithm in 98%, which is great, but in a way, well, we know if somebody has a dementia or not, any clinician can tell you that. Where it really gets interesting is between different dementias, and that's much more, much harder. So for example, does this person have Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia, as I mentioned, and we're quite far away still of really getting the same. But what we think, using all this information, even 70%, we can create a baseline on which then the clinician can work to refine it. So we're using the systematic data and then it can be tailored to that patient by the clinician. So it gives a much, much, a great logarithm in the background to help basically improving the patient's lives. Okay, that was the most complicated slide, so I hope everybody is still happy. You can have a breather. And really at the end, I'm just really going to talk about treatment and management. And treatment and management, it's one of the most frustrating topics to talk about in dementia because there is still very, very little around. Um, people have really, really compared it to where cancer research was 30 years ago, and I think that's a very fair comparison. In particular, if you consider that dementia is still getting eight times less research funding than cancer. So there is a really, it's still very underfunded, but things are changing. Now, there are many drug trials out there which look at all these proteins, which I showed you, and people look at this, try to stop it. They try it first in mice, then do healthy kind of uh, safety checks. These drug trials take a long time. So a drug trial from the beginning really to the medication in the end can take a good 10, 15 years. So you see there's a long time when things are happening and for the patients and the families, of course, it's very, very frustrating because they don't know yet what's happening. Now, most medication has been very poor. You have to say that drug trials have been aborted. 
because some have been had adverse effects on the patients and some had very little effect. So there's really what we think instead, what we should be really focusing on and what we want to do here in the future at UEA, what we're very keen on, how can we treat and manage much better these symptoms? Because even if a medication is found, what we can see, nobody's talking about the cure at the moment. Everybody's just talking about slowing down the disease or maybe stopping the disease. So the patients will still have symptoms, you will still have to manage them. So this is one area where we will be working a lot on. I'll just give you one thing which we started before we left Cambridge, so it's still continuing in Cambridge, which is on something called oxytocin, which is a hormone. And I talked to you already about the beautiful emotional faces and <coughs> didn't ask you to name them. But this is, as I said, for the families and carers, a big problem. Loss of empathy when the patients get less empathetic. They're really the coldness of the patient for some patients. As I said, not all very specific dementias only have this. It's really, really terrible. Now, oxytocin is this hormone. It's produced in the, uh, in the hypo uh, hypophysis. And the beautiful thing of it, you can actually buy it as a nasal spray. So it's very easy to administer for families and really get it delivered to the brain straight away. Now, this might be a bit strange because oxytocin is a hormone which has been really used for, it's actually used for maternal in, inducing contractions in women in gynecology. But, and it's also used as uh, the milk letting reflex. But it has been shown that it's really involved in bonding and empathy as well. And there have been several studies out with this, and I'm not making this up, as I said, with science and nature stuff even, where they showed that oxytocin is related in mice to the ultrasonic sound uh, uh, call of the pups. Then this other, even more bizarre study where they looked at eye gaze between owners and their dogs, and they gave the dogs oxytocin and the dogs look longer at the owners. <laughs> I kid you not, this is nature, you know, the top science journal. So people really do amazing studies. But this is a, more interesting for us. This is in autistic children. And in autism, we have this very often these problems of the, the autistic children have problems understanding emotions, understanding empathy. And they've shown very good results in autism. So we're conducting at the moment this pilot trial, very small trial, very specific patients where we're looking then at these social cognition changes as outcome measure and brain changes. And as you can see, there's also carer burden. So we're also taking into account, does this really make a change to the family? Is this not just an academic exercise? Does it make an impact in real life? I don't have the results yet for you, I'm afraid. But next year, hopefully, I will have. And I'm very happy to talk about it then, which we think, uh, but uh, as we can see, this is a way forward of treating symptoms in the disease, which hopefully will help quite a lot of patients. Now, the other thing which what really excited me of coming to UEA was the diet and nutrition side. And Dave already mentioned this. I think there's such an expertise here. It would be really, we should really tap into this for dementia. And there is enormous, of course, evidence that all these diet and nutrition, probiotics, prebiotics, vitamins, even uh, the, uh, the minerals, essential fatty acids, that they have an impact on brain health. So this is the prevention side. It's an area which I have to admit is new to me, but I can see there's a lot of expertise here. So if I combine my dementia expertise with the diet and nutrition expertise, I think we can create something really exciting. And of course, there is the work by Anne-Marie Minahan, for example, looking at omega-3, uh, which is all this Mediterranean diet. And you read always about this, and many people are interested in this in terms of dementia, because of course, omega-3 has been shown to, can induce neurogenesis in the hippocampus which I'm not sure, to be honest, about dementia. The same with flavonoids. Uh, we have, of course, there are loads of research in that as well happening. What I think actually what can help with this, which I talked about before, is inflammation. So in dementia, one big problem is that inflammation fans really the neurodegeneration. The more inflammation, usually the faster disease progresses. And these are, of course, very anti-inflammatory. So if we can use this information of anti-inflammatory kind of general compounds to really slow down or change the disease trajectory, I think we have a good chance you know, of helping in, in, um, improving quality of life. Now, finally, 
Uh, I talk about the gastroenterology is very big here as well, and of course the Institute of Food Research. And the microbiome, so these are all the bacteria living in your gut really, has been really very little studied, uh, surprisingly. You might think, well, yeah, why not? You know, the gut is a very long way away from the brain, so what are you talking about? There's really no connection here. But, of course, our gut is really influencing our brain all the time. And, you know, everybody who had ever a craving and after that felt very, very happy, well, your gut can change your mood, for sure. And this whole gut-brain axis, as people call it now, has become more and more important. The interesting thing with this is that stress and disease in the gut affects directly the brain as well. And again, inflammation, chronic inflammation in the gut can potentially really trigger things in the brain, which also means that we can change, of course, the gut potentially via food and nutrition. But this is, again, this is the future. I haven't got anything yet, but I can see there's a lot of expertise here at this place, which we really should tap into. And this is really the reason for this. This is, again, if you would delay the onset of dementia, this is what you can see. It would really kind of change the amount of patients which are in the system. And this is really not only for the health services, but of course you shouldn't forget that most dementia patients are cared for at home by families. And so there is a lot of informal carers who really spend a lot of time at home helping patients. So the burden on UK population is huge. So if we can delay it, it will have a big, big impact, even if we cannot cure it at this stage. Take home messages, you've made it through, now you just need to get the bullet points at the end. <laughs> Memory problems are sensitive but not specific symptom of dementia and this always causes a bit of controversy because lots of people still, even in the field, don't like to hear it. So memory, yes you have dementia, but it's not specific to one type of dementia, you can have it with very different types of dementias. What we propose, and as I said, we propose to develop dementia type specific symptom markers via imaging, but also via these cognition, to look much more specific. In particular, once we have the treatments in place, we need to have very specific changes to measure, so we need to have these outcome measures in place. The complexity of the brain is still a challenge for us, and really one shouldn't underestimate it. Even for a healthy brain, we still don't know completely how the brain works, so how it, what happens during the disease is a real challenge for us. But as I said, we've moved away from a localist point of view to much more a network view, which makes sense because the brain is a big network. But our understanding is really right at the beginning, so it's very early days. The management and treatment of symptoms is still really the big thing where we're lacking. As I said, there are drug trials ongoing at the moment, but nobody talks of a cure. Everybody just talks about slowing it down. And so I think there is enormous potential here at UEA to develop things with more non-pharmacological, there are also behavioral measures, of course, and clinical interventions, but also with the diet and nutrition side. Just to thank the patients and their family members who really, you know, they make our research work and they really are the centerpiece of that. Um, and of course, the person standing in front of you has done the least amount of work. It's all these other people who do really the amount of work, and in particular my main collaborators and my wife, Anita Yoshi, and other main collaborators. This is just... Uh, a few people of my group, which were previously in the group and are now in the group, and then our international collaborators, I didn't name them because we, we work very internationally, which is a challenge if you work in the, uh, with the NHS, because the NHS is very UK-specific, wants to have UK-specific outcomes, but we're talking about a global disease. So one, we're working, of course, in, with North America and Western Europe, but one particular interest of my wife and I is the developing world as well, where there is even less work for dementia, less support for dementia. So we have a big collaboration with Brazil, where we're working with a very big clinic, and another collaboration with India, actually. And in India, you have completely different challenges because people virtually never see a doctor. You have lots of illiterate patients, very different challenges. So I think these people need even more kind of our support on that side. And thank you, vielen Dank. <laughs>